Not the footy show. Show? Now for Murray. He goes away out to Pierce. He gets one away to Tom Trebojevic. It's gone to Blake Ferguson. Ferguson, can he stand up? Now he throws the pass. He's got it back to you know who. Tedesco for the corner. Tedesco's over. It's a miracle. Oh, oh yeah. What about that one? Oh. No, it's Dello. Unbelievable. What about that from James Tedesco? Appropriately puts it over the line. Down at the northern oh, end. And look at this. Keep your feet in, son. Good boy. Good boy. There it is. He should have been, I and guess, he... the man of the series last year. He won the Fittler medal for best for New South Wales in a winning series. And now he scored a double here tonight. Now that, that was outstanding. Eh? <coughs> it's always documented we've been on the end of a lot of them, so uh, we might try to, you know, we can look at that much we want that best game, but it's just been so uh, so uh, it was uh, pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. <laughs> Good everyone, welcome to episode 198 of Not The Footy Show, the New South Wales Blues, back-to-back champions in origin. I'm Warwick Nicholson, I'm joined by Mr. Rob Cox, who was there about a week ago now, because, well, I've been in Mackay, you've been, I don't know what you've been doing, Cox, but you've probably been celebrating, because New South Wales, uh, they're the champions of origin in 2019. How are you feeling? Two in a row, baby. I'm good. I'm feeling pumped. I'm feeling alive. Just finished training with... Uh, my 12 A's boys, and uh, everything's good, mate. It's good to be a New South Welshman around about now. It is. It's it's strange how, uh, you know, for all those years, we just kept getting told, you're never going to be good, you're never going to be good. Well, that was pretty much Jonathan Thurston telling Mitchell Pearce would never lift an origin shield. Uh, and if you haven't seen what happened on Instagram there, kids, look it up. Uh, but effectively, yeah, we've won two in a row. And um, we said this last year, Cocksmith, but this year we can say it with some sincere sincerity. New South Wales are simply better than Queensland. Yep, absolutely. And only by the skin of our teeth on the last one, as it turns out. But still, <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter about the score and it doesn't matter about how it happened, really. Uh, we're champions. Yeah, 26-20 in Game 3 after the comprehensive win in Game 2. Queensland had been too good in Game 1 up there at Suncorp. The series, I love watching Origin. Uh, this year uh, was probably... In the, it was. It's a few years since I've been in the NRL when I was working there. It's never the same when you're working in Origin, I find. Uh, in terms of the purely the the way you can consume the game, and I'm sure that's something that you're um, fully aware of, given you've done about four billion in a row. Uh, what I thought was 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 fascinating about the contest is the New South Wales forward pack, who none of which will get consideration for man of the series, and we know it went to James Tedesco, but they were the impetus, and we spoke about how in game two that first defensive set set the tone. It set the tone for the rest of the series because apart from really Josh Papali in uh, Game 3, who had a stormer, uh, the Queensland forward pack simply could not out-enthuse. It couldn't out-hit. It definitely couldn't uh, make as many metres as the New South Wales pack. And we'll give all the credit to Damian Cook and James Tedesco and the Haas for the Blues in Game 2 and 3. But that forward pack performance from New South Wales, simply outstanding. Mate, uh, absolutely, they are enormous, and uh, you know, special mention to to Cordner and and Trebojevic, um, yep. who you know, who both both did a, an amazing job leading the team, and that's really what they were. They were leaders on the field by example, if not by the the captain next to their name. Um, yeah, hats off. It's it's really hard for a forward to win man of the series, isn't it? Because there's mm. uh, not a lot of flash goes on in the forwards. There's a lot of uh, grunt work and a lot of. Uh, you know, blood, sweat, and tears happens up there, and and most of the flash stuff happens out the back. But um, yeah, mate, they were they were amazing. They were really, you know, tough, tough forward pack. I reckon it's the best game I've seen Boyd Cordner play in a few years. Yeah, uh, he although he did get exposed on the two tries uh, that Queensland came back on, he was phenomenal in that match. And yeah, it's good to see him sort of hit that that impact level again because unfortunately, you know, we all know well if you don't know people, he had. Serious injuries at the age of like 17, 18, 19. Uh, and he played first grade really early. But, you know, he's had a career already. Uh, and this is all bonus, really. And he's like 27 or 28. So 
yeah, it's funny how long he's been in the game, but it's great to see him. I think the relief, and he said it in the press conference or the, the post-match um, presentation, he, he alluded to the fact that, you know, all you fans who are at home or at the ground who have put up with New South Wales on the being on the losing end for so long, the fact that you turn out again and you can sit there and enjoy it, he, he used the word, that's why we're the best state. Now, on the wins and losses column, obviously Queensland still have a higher percentage, but... I liked how he didn't shy away from the fact that this is something you've got to celebrate. Mm. As as rugby league fans slash New South Wales fans, we went through those eight years, and it was like going through the desert. Uh, <laughs> who was gonna Who was gonna be our Moses? I mean, we've had some interesting ones, but now we finally have the better players, and it's it's significant. I think that we have got the better players. Mm. Cook and Tedesco just phenomenal, and Tedesco gets man of the series. He probably should have won it last year. Damien Cook, I thought, was pretty much his equal across the whole series in terms of the way the game uh, was impacted. But, I mean, we're going to talk about it uh, right now because we have to. But, mate, um, Mitchell Pearce, what a way (laughs) to put the final pages in your origin career chapter. I mean, that's just as good as it gets, isn't it? Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, look, I don't think he was outstanding in the game, to be honest. No, I, no. I, you know, me, I, I'm not I'm not a great uh, Mitchell Pearce fan. But I think uh, he I think he did exactly what he had to do, um, which is all you really have to do. Uh, yeah. And uh, he's got the got the, the winning um, series win next to his name now. And uh, he's uh, he can obviously sleep easier at night. Yeah. Um, you know, in saying that, he wasn't shocking, of course. I, I think all of the Blues players played well. Um, I just think uh, most people thought that, that he would go in as the dominant half, and it really didn't seem that way to me. It seemed that Maloney was running the show, um, and um, he was uh, he was just doing what he had to do, and he did it. So, yeah, good yeah. job. I think that's that's you, you made that interesting point around he wasn't the dominant half, and you know he, he didn't have a, a game that you just stood up and went, wow. But this is kind of a kind of it kind of sums up his origin career as far as I'm concerned. He's never had that that Uber game where you just go, "Wow, Mitchell Pearce at Origin, he's made for it." But the beauty of I guess this last game cameo that he puts in is he's the one that backs himself to set up the try that wins the series, and that's what I love about the way Origin can throw things up is that you know you can have all your deriding of Mitchell Pearce for as many years as you like in Origin Arena. But ultimately, his last pass in the Origin Arena sets up the series-winning try. Yeah. And if he doesn't back himself, which you can understand after how many years of, of, of copying it, then he wouldn't throw that pass. But he threw that pass, and you know it is it is an incredible final chapter for him. I'll I just go, you know, all the stuff he's put been put through. I'm so happy for him. Yeah. Look, here's the thing with Mitchell Pearce, and 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 I think he's probably learnt this a bit from Maloney. Um, Mitchell Pierce. When you compare someone like Mitchell Pierce to say Nathan Cleary, um, the thing is with Cleary, Cleary doesn't make many mistakes, right? He's he's quite safe. Uh, he, you know, you can you can bank on him. Um, but what he what what Nathan doesn't have yet, seemingly, is that um, willingness to to put his you know put his uh, on the chopping block, um, if you like. And and whereas Pierce and Maloney will do that. Um, Maloney more so he'll he'll you know he'll really he's got they call him the goldfish you know because he forgets about a mistake that he <laughs> might have made thirty seconds well, earlier. He had, about, he had about three of those in the last ten minutes. That he had to yeah, about, but yes, but but Pierce is willing to do it. Now mm. I'm not saying that that Nathan wouldn't have thrown that ball, but it was a risky play at that point of time, at that point of the field, yep. at that point of the game. Um, it it was a risky play, and he he threw it, and the rest is history. So uh, good on him. I mean. Um, you know, I hope going forward, Nathan um, gets a little bit more risk in his play, just not mm. too much. It's always always that fine balance. You know, it's like uh, it's like putting the chili in the in the stew. You don't want to put too much in, otherwise you've done it. You know, you've overcooked it. But um, no, full full marks to all of them, mate. Every single one of those uh, boys throughout the whole series that wore the blue. Um, you know, not just in game three, but all of them. Um, good job, every one of them. Yeah, Maloney does deserve a special credit because he did come into the team after being ceremoniously dumped. And if you listen to the Fitler commentary after the match, he pretty much said, "We just couldn't pick him." We said to him, "You're not pl- you're playing you're playing useless. Mm. <laughs> We're not picking you." And, then uh, and he came Cody back Walker. and yeah, and he came back in game two and was the difference. And um, yeah, even though that last ten minutes, the reason that I can't fault him too badly is he was trying to win the game. He made 
three pretty big errors, but he was trying to win the game. Yeah. And that is all you ask. You don't want, as you say, it, the player to be too safe or too overawed. And I think where you where you make a really good point about Cleary is this is maybe why coming into first grade too early is sometimes mm-hmm. never a good thing for you because you're too afraid to make a mistake. Those are the mistakes that you'll make in um, you know, the Holden Cup, or that's gone obviously now, but the reserve grade where you've got a little bit more leniency, you haven't got the same quality against you. Maybe you will try some things. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think the, the beauty of the Nathan Cleary um, uh, career ahead is that there is a lot of career ahead oh, he's, yeah. he's going to develop. It's, it's, there's no doubt about yeah, that. Yeah, look, look, I'm not saying Nathan doesn't have trick shots. I, I was lucky mm. enough to go out to Penrith training um, this week and, and um, uh, you know, I took my son out so he could watch a bit of Penrith training. Um, and the, the trick shots that he's got at training, he's got them. That, that, yep. Don't worry about that. He's uh, no, no. he's yep. got plenty of them, but it's just the willingness or the the readiness for him to pull them out in games is, you know, uh, he's not making many mistakes at the moment. Um, I mean, he hasn't played for a couple of weeks, but they're not making. He's not making many mistakes at the moment. They're winning games, um, and um, you know, maybe little by little he'll start to bring that into his game. Um, maybe just not yet, but uh, you know, that's that's the development of a player, like you say. Maybe it it is. A little bit of a weird thing to come into first grade so early because I, I tend to think it does. Um, uh, what's the word for it? Inhibit them a little bit in their yep. in their experimenting in their growth and whatnot. But um, that's probably a different conversation for a different podcast, mate. Yeah, it probably is. Look, we need to give uh, probably the best Queensland players a bit of recognition. I thought Munster was probably their best across the series. Yep, I agree. Closely followed by Papali, who was probably oh. once they lost that Jai Arrow. Papali was John Ormus. How good was he in three? Oh, mate, the moment he went off, the moment he went off, Queensland lost the momentum. Yeah. It was a, it was a really strange one where you go, you know, he can play big minutes. Do you, do you go against the pre-game plan and let him play a little bit longer? And yeah, yeah, he was he was great. And I think Ponga, obviously, the way he played in game Absolutely. one, I thought he was the difference in in game one and didn't get a chance to play in game two. Yeah. Uh, what I the, the funniest comment was actually made at the end of game three by Fatty, who who loves a headline, loves a loves a comment that'll get everyone going, but he pretty much goes. And he wasn't wrong in his assessment, but he goes, oh, Cameron Munster, I mean, how good was he at fullback? I mean, he'll be there forever. And you're going... <laughs> yeah, like, what about KP? Last, <laughs> last week. I mean, let's just... I think he, he realised that in about 30 seconds after he said it. But it was just funny hearing that. It's like that prisoner of the moment thing. I think you could probably leave at Munster at six and, and Ponger at, nine, at, at one and you'll be going okay. Yep. But uh, the player I feel sorry for, and it's what I was going to just... Back to, back to with the Cleary thing, or the Pierce thing, where he, he backed himself to make that play. Dudley Cherry Evans was lambasted by the Queensland media when he turned his back on the Titans X amount of years ago. Uh, there's a headline that came out that called him a dirty cockroach, and it's just like, <laughs> now he's your now he's your, your Queensland captain, and, and, and Kevy said, you're going to love him. He didn't have a bad series. He played okay. He, he wasn't a factor in game two at all. Uh, he was solid in game one. But there'll be a play that will be bugging him um, no end for the next 12 months. And that will be the fact that he went for the bomb with about um, 80 seconds left from 40 metres out instead yeah. of going for the field goal. And to your to your point around Nathan Cleary maybe not willing to take that risk, to me it's like that was the problem that, that that's the dilemma that uh, DCE faced. Do I do I give New South Wales seven tackles to come down the field with a minute to go or do I try and win the game? I mean, yeah. if he has his time over again, does he do it differently? Yeah. I, I don't know the answer. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I've watched that play a couple of times, and, he, and he, he did run out a bit of time, I think. Uh, Mbai was very slow to get to his feet and then wanted to have he a chat. tried to milk a penalty. Then yep. wanted to have a chat with the referee. Um, not really the play to make from Mbai there in that situation because, um, you know, it, it just the, the, the drop goal that they would have had set up was exposed. And, um, you know, uh, what they needed there was a, a you know, Get get to your feet very quickly, play the ball, and no chatting. Um, yep. Yeah. But it didn't happen, mate. And and um, you know, I guess it will probably haunt DCE for a little while that one. But you know, he'll get on with it, mate. He's a champion. He's a very 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 yeah. good player. So he'll get on with it. It is a couple of things that I just need to round out uh, the Origin series and a couple of points. Uh, how good is it watching uh, James Tedesco and Tom Trebojevic be on the field at the same time? It is magic. It's oh, it's. Yeah. Oh, it's just it's just great. It's it's a lovely feeling. Well, what the about what point, about with yeah. Damian Cook running from from nine as well? You know, you get that nice <laughs> drive out of out of dummy half, and everything starts to move forward. You know, it's great. It's and it's sort of where I'm going to with this next point is that 
uh, if you look at the last six Origin series, it's 3-3. Would you believe we've actually evened up a period of time <laughs> over? Uh, it's nice. I mean, it's it's still um, three from uh, your cherry picking, right? <laughs> three from fourteen, but it's it's three from six, two in a row. Uh, that, but it, what it leads me to is the question around you know what's the kind of legacy that Tedesco and Cook can make for themselves because we've had this chat off air. I'm pretty sure, but they have the chance to be the best New South Wales one and best New South Wales number nine that we've seen because of the opportunity that is ahead of them. They're both in their mid twenties. Um, they have that ability to change games and they need to change series over the next sort of, let's be honest, two to three seasons to get into that conversation. But if you put it down on paper, uh, cook is, <laughs> he is a player that when you look at him, you just go, surely he can't get all that out of that body. And he does. There's been some uns, Outstanding New South Wales hookers over time. Well, I mean, he, the Danny- here's the thing, though, mate. Yeah, let's let's like just pause on this for a moment. Cook was un- bring it up. Cook was unwanted by St George, Canterbury. Yep. I believe he was at Penrith um, for a, for a brief moment. There was three or four clubs that didn't want him. And it was and, the Dragons, and, well, Dragons, and dra- well, Dragons. I'm, I'm sh- wasn't there another one? When, Pretty sure it was Dragons. There was Dragons, Dragons Dragons, and Canterbury, but there was one more. I'm sure there was one more. Anyway, um, and, and that's because he was playing fullback, centre, uh, a little bit of halfback. Um, but he had that he had that season at the back end of, I think it was 14 or 15 at Canterbury, at Canterbury yep. where he carved up. And they chose Lysha And they instead. signed Michael Leisha. Yep. And you just go, what? Yeah. Um, he and Desi Hasler is the one that pretty much told him he did don't need you. Um, <laughs> mm, Desmond on fire, mm. uh, but that's the beauty of as you say it's it's the he was on the scrap heap as of you know a couple of years ago in terms of you know he wasn't a established uh, number nine but now he is the guy. I mean Robbie Farrow was at South when Damien Cook got there. That's right. I mean that's oh rugby league you're you're a crazy thing cruel cruel but but, but uh kind at the same time benny, Eli- but... benny elias and uh, uh danny Baderas are the sort of the two hookers that yep. are probably at the top of the tree for new south wales mm. he has the ability and he's got the, if he if he gets new south wales to a bunch more series wins he enters that conversation as far as i'm concerned sure because he is a more dynamic he is he's not as creative naturally as what benny elias was and um danny was just a, a great footballer but there is something about Damien Cook that is just, um, I'm just it's, a, it's a joy to watch. And then Teddy probably has his nose in front a little bit further in terms of the great New South Wales fullbacks. Uh, the ones that come to mind, uh, E.T. was awesome at fullback for New South Wales, even though he played centre for his club. Uh, Timmy Brasher, uh, Anthony Minocello, um, Jared Hayne when the spirit moved him. <laughs> Gary Jack, obviously, going back a few years. But, you know, there's, there's an opportunity there for yeah, these two players to absolutely. go down as the best. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I agree, mate. Um, the f- the future's bright as long as we keep, uh, you know, uh, the, the the having the forward pack and and the other players to uh, be the um, supporting players on those two. I think they could build teams around those two for a long time. Final points on Origin uh, on episode one hundred and ninety eight of Not the Footy Show. Uh, the number one thing that I just think we have to round back to, given it was before our last, um, oh, game, game two pod, we asked what's happened on the trail, etc. Well, Freddie made his decision and he got exactly what he didn't get from Latrell in game one, from Jack White in game two and game three. He didn't get the brilliance, but he got the enthusiasm, the effort, um, the commitment in defense, the just the the tempo, I think, that he wanted from, the, from that position. And full credit to Brad Fitley, he got it 100% right. I hope to see Latrell Mitchell back in the team next year, but Freddie deserves credit. He got it, he got it spot on. Yeah, no, he, he mate, he's um he's very good at sniffing out the players that will compete, Freddie. Um, you know, and he and he might have got it a little bit wrong in in game one. Uh, when you yeah. look at um, you know, listening to other people. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, but but also, you know, he he hadn't seen how those players reacted in a in an Origin arena for twelve months. So, um, you know, you can understand it being a little bit off kilter. But uh, he, you, you're a hundred percent right, mate. Um, Whiten was um. Uh, you know, I, I still think Latrell, on his day, can be probably the most devastating attacking player in the world. But yeah. that's when the mood strikes, and also when the timing's right, and all that sort of stuff. And I, I think um, White and just brought the enthusiasm to that left hand side, and um, the rest followed. You know, 
the final thing to say on Origin is, I'm sorry, Fergo. All right, let's go to uh, a <laughs> break. We'll be back to talk about Gabby Wilder's future at the uh, Queensland team or with the Gold Coast Titans here on Not The Footy Show. Not The Footy Show. show? Why, why do you beat up Fergo? Why don't you like him? No 2014, edit out. <laughs> Okay, we're back. It's episode 198, not the footy show. We've reviewed Origin 3, back-to-back blues. How good is it? Uh, Piercy's final Origin chapter, amazing. Cook and Tedesco, etc., etc. But we have to get to Kevy Walters, mate. Um, he said that he had a great team. He said that they believed they could win. They expect to win. They did not. What's going on with Kevy? No, oh, mate, who knows? I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of over all the Kevy talk, to be honest. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I obviously remember Kevy as a player, and I, I don't really know him as a fella, apparently, from everyone says he's a good bloke. But yeah. um, I don't know. You're talking about the Titans. I, 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 tend to think, I tend to think the Titans need need something else than, than Kevy. Um, look, Kevy was a fantastic player, um, but he's an unproven coach. He's a rookie coach, no matter what. Um, you know, yeah, he's, he's coached 12 games of, um, of, of origin um, and he's lost the last two series. Uh, you know, and some say that he got more out of his men than what they expected in um, mm-hmm. the, last, um, the last game and in the first game. But uh, look, I, look, I'm not buying it, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm, I think that the Titans need a, a coach in there with structure and a coach that's willing to pull the trigger on a few of them and um, get culturally try and get the Titans correct. But I think Kevy will get the job if he wants it um, because they've already said so. And also because his old mate, Mal Meninga is in there and uh, we know how relationships go in, in rugby league. I don't know if there's any more, um, more of a political or um, a sport that's driven by nepotism uh, then rugby league. So I I believe that if he wants it, he's got it, baby. Mm. So that just obviously leads to the fact that Garth Brennan was let go. Uh, evidently, almost before the Penrith Panthers game on Friday. Oh, he was gone before then. He was gone when, talk, when they brought Mal in. Too. When they brought in Mal in. That, and they obviously did the review, et cetera, which is their prerogative. They're welcome to do it. Uh, he apparently packed up his desk uh, before the Penrith game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is yeah interesting. So Mal Meninga is now the, well, I guess his high his performance influence, director. High performance. His influence now goes to personnel decisions. I would imagine. Oh, 100 percent. And uh, Craig Hodges and Luke Burt are the interim coaches at the Gold Coast Titans. At least to two questions. Um, obviously the Kevy question: Does he come in? Who is the coach? And uh, there was a story that broke on Channel Nine News tonight. Uh, it's uh, Tuesday night about nine o'clock. And it was that a consortium is looking to move the Titans to Brisbane to play eight games out of there, change the name, change the whole thing, start again, as they say. Mm. Categorically, I think that is a colossal error. Um, I don't think that's the thing you should be doing. You've worked so hard to try and um, get yourself on the Gold Coast again. The one thing I probably wouldn't agree with what they did was that they decided to cast away the Giants and Seagulls and Chargers history. Um, I think that would probably almost be the best thing they could do to reconnect with that audience is to say that is part of our club's history Um, because that's, you know, we've we've left you once before. I hope we don't leave you again. You've got to have that message going out to the fans because they're sitting there right now just going, we got told that we'd we'd done our due diligence and we've got the right guy in and we've given him a year and a half (laughs) and then we've punted him. Mm. It's it's a really bitter pill for those fans to swallow. And that's the, the challenge, I guess, for the Titans as much as anything is how do you get your fans to believe in you again, especially if the story then emerges tonight, they're going to go to Brisbane. I mean, I think it's a really delicate situation for the Gold Coast Titans. Yeah, look, I think the hardest thing for them to swallow is the losses and the disappointing results on the field. Um, mm. You know, the Garth Brennan, you know, the, the sacking of coaches or players can be, can be you know, um, you know, a short amount of time will heal that. Um, but where they are, where they are on the field, and some of off the field stuff that they've got going on at the moment is uh, bewildering. You know, um, I, look, there's there's been lots of lots of NRL experts have have um, 
you know, had their say on what they think should happen. I, I just noticed on NRL 360 tonight, Billy Moore um, had a had a conversation with Icon and Co about, um, you know, why not kind of amalgamate the Burley Bears with the the North Sydney Bears and turn them into the Gold Coast Bears. But he he's adamant that they should stay on the Gold Coast. Um, yeah, they need to. You know, and and that they they need to do something. I think they need a total restructure. Um, and I know that I know that they've already been through a few restructures in the five years that they've been back in the mm. in the comp. But um, is it five years, six years, whatever it is? Um, two thousand seven, it was. So it's twelve. Oh, really? That long? Okay. Since it's been yep. the Titans, they've they've had a, a number of you know restarts and reboots, and let's clean up, let's clean the slate again and go again. Um, but I, you know. Jeff Tuvey the other night on three sixty put his hand up to coach him, said he'd be interested. Mm. Um, I think they could do a lot worse than than Jeff Tuvey. Um, I think Tuvey would probably bring the discipline that's required. It's got to be a hard place to, to to have a football team. Look, I mean, look look geographically where they are. They're yeah. on the party strip. Um, yeah, it, there's lots of distractions going on there. Um, but because it's the sixth largest city in Australia as far as population goes, um, it's uh, you know, service paradise and whatnot. Um, it's but there's a there's a massive catchment between them and Brisbane. Oh yeah, of, of, of rugby league people. That's where Cameron Smith's from, for crying out loud. Yeah. and then you've got the northern um, reaches of New South Wales. I mean, that's probably the biggest thing to me is that are they? Uh, no, I can't. I can't speak. I'm not there. But what I'm saying is, you don't get the feeling that it, it, it extends down. Yet it should. It's that they they came into the competition in '88 as the Gold Coast Tweed Giants. Mm. I think come was the Gold Coast. They were they were both both parties, and yeah, yeah it's there's a there's a catchment area there that's huge. Oh, I mean, the, the big area of rugby league, oh. but, but also you know like, there's been other people talk about that maybe they should relocate even if it's for half the time to to Toowoomba or Ipswich, um, which you know there's argument for that as well. There's a lot of rugby league players developing in the western parts of Brisbane, uh, out mm. towards Toowoomba. So. You know, it's such a hard thing. You know, do you, do you do you do you thumb your nose a little bit at the Gold Coast people and move half of your games elsewhere just to get the players away from the Gold Coast? Um, there's obviously that's, not, that's probably not going to do that. that. That wouldn't do the trick though, because you're still going to have to have a training base. Well, and well, why not make the training base at Toowoomba? I mean, I'm just chucking them out there, mate. But I mean, there's something yeah, yeah. obviously doing over the twenty. Five years or however many years they've been trying to get a team off the ground there, why they have never had success, you know, and 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 I believe it's geographic. I believe that there are too many distractions. There's too much stuff going on. There's too many bright lights. There's too much glamour. There's too much, you know, players being distracted and and whatnot. That there is definitely something happening there that isn't conducive to good rugby league teams and it can't just be the personnel because they've had personnel tell personnel changes probably up to a dozen times in all of yep. those years as far as like top of the top of the um uh you know in the football office and in the trainers and whatnot i mean for, for me i i just think that they have to have a, an almighty shake up i don't believe mal mening is the man to do it um i believe that they need to bring in a whole new clean sweep of of tough hard nut people that are this there to play rugby league and they need to keep they need they, you know here's another thing here's another little one for you maybe yep. they shouldn't be signing them to anything longer than two year contracts you know so that they can you know perform if you perform you'll get another contract if you don't mate you're gone and it's as mm -hmm. simple as that is that the way to build a rugby league team i'm not too sure because sometimes humans don't react well to threats or to instability so what are your thoughts on it was oh they got to stay on the gold coast the coach thing is massive for them. The, the talk was Craig Fitzgibbon's the front runner, but I mean, have they even talked to anybody yet? Is my guess my, my my other part of the um, thought process. You, you, yeah, I, I'm with you. There's talk that maybe or names being thrown up, not talk. It's people throw names. It's the way it works. Tim Sheens at the Gold Coast. I mean, the the funny thing about the Gold Coast is it does have. I, I don't can't speak categorically on this, but the Keeper Park School, I'm not sure who owns that right still. But I don't know. I, I Somehow I think you need a bit of a season head up there um, running things. But there could be an outstanding candidate who's you know, in his 30s, in his early 40s, whatever. You don't know. There's no guarantees, I guess, from players retire they're going to be great coaches or not. We know that. That's, that's pretty much proven. What I would love to see with the Titans is that they don't um, 
pack up and leave. That's probably my biggest thing that I, I look at because they've got a great stadium there. Um, they do do work. They do work with that area. They just haven't got. I, I got one thing I will say about Titans, and I'm I'm probably going back a little bit here. But when they came in in 2007, I was always concerned about the longevity of their or the sustainability of their success. Because if you recall, they came in and they signed a lot of really good footballers. In 2009, they got to or 2010, I think it was 2009, 2010. They were they were in the mix for the premiership. They got I think it was 2010. They played a premier. They got, yeah, they premier final against the Roosters, um, and they fell short. But the challenge was always for them was going to be if we go really hard at success early, how does our development go? Are we are we creating pathways for those players who are? 22, 23, who have tracked to the club, but they're not going to get a chance because the players who are 27, 28 getting the massive money are going to be there for five years. Mm. And they're on a good deal and they're going to stick around. And that was always my concern is how do you develop players into that system if the, the pure focus is winning? I don't know if they've recovered from that. Um, it may have ended up in a premiership. And look, at the end of the day, if you had that opportunity again, would you do the same thing? You probably would if you're the Titans. You're trying to get a new a new stadium. Uh, you're looking for success. I understand it. It's just that you're in this position now where the likes of Payne Haas have slipped through your fingers. Um, mm. it, you know, players go where the money is sometimes, and the converse thing seems to happen with the Titans in that the players who can't get the money at the club they want to stay at take the money at the Titans. Well, now, well what about a, what about this? You know, like en- enough yeah. conjecture. Give me three things that they can do to turn it around. Three things. Oh gee, three things. Well, they've got to get an experienced coach, as far as I'm, but uh, but a coach who's undergone a rebuild somewhere else before. I don't want necessarily a situation where the coach has been at one place and had um, average success. This this person needs to have done it a few times because they're going to have to have different ways they approach it with different players. So experienced coaches who's built clubs before. So let's just say Tim Sheens. All mm-hmm. right. Uh, the second thing is you've got to get your salary cap in order in terms of what are you spending, what are you getting. Our, there was numbers put out today um, in regards to that, but you know all players basically have eight weeks of the season to prove that they should be there next year. To your to your point, the the hard um, approach. I mean, we know that contracts are pretty useless these days if you want to get rid of someone. So yeah. that would be my biggest thing is that they're on that. And the last one is you've got to engage your community. I mean, I've been following this pretty closely, um, and yeah, the the fans are like, what is happening? Mm. We don't know what's happening. Mm. Mm. Um, what is the what is the aim? I mean, I'll give you a little micro uh, view into this: is that they they signed Callum Watkins from the UK Super League, who's twenty eight this year. He's an international. He's played two hundred and fifty games of Super League and had success. Mm. I'm still struggling to see anywhere. A club, fans are asking the club, "When can he play for us? When can he play for us?" Mm. Well, and nobody knows. Found, Is that right? No. I only I only found something when I looked it up on Twitter, the Savo, and that's Tony Webeck who does the NRL dot com stuff. Said, "Oh well, apparently there's still visa issues." Right. But that's a that's a that's a that's a real like. If mm. you sign this guy, who's going to be your starting centre for probably the next three years, if you sign him on big money, like this is the challenge you're always going to have. And, and how do you how do you engage back with your fans? And it's got to be an open dialogue. Look, at the end of the day, the damage has been done in this last little period. You will understand that your fans will actually be sympathetic to your situation. But you can't treat them with a um, approach that is like, no, nah, we can't we can't we can't reveal anything. Like mm. you can't do it that way. Because fans see through that and they just go, Well, you don't care about us. Yeah. And that's to me, that's a that's a huge thing. If you want to st- if A, you gotta decide you're gonna stay at the Gold Coast, but B, you've got to give your fans a reason to care. Yeah. Well, look, we've got all the solutions here, mate. So you know, I reckon if they take those three three on board to start off with, they're probably on the right track, to be honest. Uh, we'll see how we go. Look, we have more questions from our listeners, believe it or not, uh, and we'll get to them on the last segment of Not The Footy Show, episode 198. Not The Footy Show. show? Is one of our listeners M. Meninga from, um, from Narang? What do you do? I'm an architect. <laughs> have you designed any buildings in New York? Have you seen the uh, new addition to the Guggenheim? You did that? Yep, yep. It didn't take very long either. Not the footy show. Okay, it's question time here on the footy show. It's at 198. Warwick Nicholson, Rob Cox, 35 minutes in. 
it's still going to go an hour. I hate you, Rob Cox. No, it's not. Anyway, we're getting through it. Uh, all right, the questions, they're coming in thick and fast. The first question, VC asks, what is Jai Arrow worth on the open market, even though he is not off contract until the end of next season? <laughs> What's he worth, mate? Yeah, well, you know, look, I guess he's he's worth what you'll pay for him, but I think he's probably worth six hundred. Yeah, I reckon he's worth six hundred k at the top end, five hundred at the bottom. Um, you know, I guess it depends on how he finishes this year up. But if he's smart, he'll get his contract signed up. When's he? When's he out till? When's he? End of next year. End of he's next off year. Contracts end of next year. Okay, so he can't legally be able to negotiate <laughs> until after this year. Sorry. But, Someone said something that was funny. Yeah, um, but we all know that he'll probably have one signed, sealed, and delivered for Christmas this well, year. Well, the story already is the the eels have lined him up. Like, mm. honestly, I mean, stuff like this doesn't help. <laughs> if you're a Titans fan, you go and our best player is being targeted by a club in Sydney. I mean, fantastic. Well, yeah, um, yeah. I think you'll get seven to eight. I would imagine. It's just people just yeah, they'll they'll pay anything these days. Jeez, that's and, a lot of money for it. That's a lot of oh, money for a back row, back I know, row, man. front row, whatever. It is. Um, you know. It's about how you use your salary cap. We'll get to another one of those in a second. But we reckon, so you reckon five to six, I reckon you'll get seven to eight. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd reckon I'd be happy if my club signed him for 600. You know, that I mean, that'd, okay. be, that'd be feasible. Yep. Anything over uh, is overs. Yep, sorry. Our uh, Asian correspondent uh, from Singapore, mm. um, AW, he says, what is the story with Mark Coyne? What's, what's happened with Mark Coyne? Well, it emerged this evening that Mark Coyne has been stood down as an ARLC commissioner. Why? Um, he was detained apparently in Singapore about six weeks ago at the start of the Origin series for something. And incredibly, uh, the powers that be have somehow kept this under wraps for the duration of the Origin series. Uh, he has effectively been said, uh, Peter Beatty's released a statement that said, until I sit down and talk with Mark, he is currently off the commission. Well, they find, they finally caught up with him and charged him for, for theft when he stole that try in 94 and 5, wasn't <laughs> I hadn't brought that up, mate, but is James Tedesco's try in Origin 3 um, our Mark Coyne Absolutely. moment? Absolutely. question. Absolutely. It I hope, I hope oh. it gets replayed as many times. Yes, Although Matt Duncan, that one was for you, um, former co-hoster on, on the footy show. Mm. Um, I messaged him the next morning as I was flying up to Mackay and said, oh, I happened to catch the end of the game um, last night. For some reason, he was up at 5 a.m. Mark Coyne, I don't know. This is well, that's a bit of mystery, yeah. isn't it? I wonder what they've. What, what do you get pulled up for in Singapore? Exactly right. I don't. I don't know. But it's obviously serious enough or... that they've kept this. They've kept this sort of. You know, very much on. The, I mean, Roy Masters, I think, was the guy who broke it. Mm. Um, Did he, so he didn't he toss up a reason. Ah, uh, oh, I'm not willing to jump onto it if it's not confirmed. To okay. be perfectly honest with you. Uh, but yeah, he's he's off the commission or he's stood down for the commission. So mm. that is interesting. So AW, uh, he's our man on the ground. Get some info for us. Did you um, know Did you know that Mark Coyne is a next door neighbour of uh, the great Gus Gould? Phil Gould. Gould. I do because we both listen to the Phil Gould podcast <laughs> and it's outstanding. <laughs> Bracey, I want your job. Uh, anyway, um, we go to With H. That's what I'm calling him now. Um, he asked the question, is Ricky Stewart on track for coach of the year? No, no. Uh, I Bellamy will get it again. <clears throat> you think so? Yep. Yeah. Why, why would Ricky get it? What are they going to win? Well, if they finish top four, if they finish top three, finish top no. two. No. No, I reckon Bellamy will get it again, mate. I mean, look at him. They're three games clear now. Um, they're kicking booty, basically. They're absolutely a class above at the moment. No, I, I'm not discounting it. I, I think that's... Of course you know, you're not. Like... Of course you're not, Was. Oh, hang on, What sorry. are you wearing well, at the moment? Um, well, nothing, but that's... Yeah, nothing apart really from a green everything. scarf and a green beanie. Uh, um, speaking of which, how's uh, Mary McGregor going for And you, one mate? green sock. Sorry? <laughs> how's Mary McGregor going for oh, you? He's going... He's on fire, isn't he? I can I can taste the ribs already. Uh, yeah, anyway... Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, Oppo asks, how will Andrew Eddinghausen go on Australian Survivor? I'm not going to comment. I don't know anything about that. Is he on a, He's on Survivor, is he? Apparently he's one of the, the, the defend, defenders or champions or something. I don't know. Is there anyone um, else, Anyone else? another rugby league player on Survivor? No, I think Nova Paris Kneebone's out there. Um, oh, is she? Hmm, well, she's a Survivor. I Nova, she I, I've, I have never watched an episode so of the Australian version, so I have no idea how it'll go. He can fish, though. Um, anyway, finally, uh, uh, the final story, and this is the big one uh, as we close up the show. Josh Reynolds, would you believe it? 
is free to talk to other clubs per NRL.com. I'm stunned. He's allowed to talk to them now? Yep. Talk to anyone he likes because they <coughs> don't want to pay him all his money. They'll pay some, apparently, but they don't want to pay at all. And they will see no avenue back into him for him to get into first grade because Benji is playing like Benji. Can you believe it's lasted this long before this part of the story came? Like, this became the story? I, no. I no, look, stunned I it mean, didn't happen this I, time last year. I, I, I know I know amongst a few, you know, like, I mean, no disrespect to Josh Reynolds, but when when the Tigers wanted to sign him on a four-year deal worth 850, or was it five-year deal, whatever it was, for 850 grand, um, you know, a few mates and I were kind of joking that he'd be high-fiving and thinking it was a fantastic deal. I mean, he's I know he's not... He's not old, but he's not a spring mm. chicken. He's not 21. Um, he is at the back end of his career, and and I would have thought 850 big ones. Um, who's to say? Who's to say he's going to? Wh- why would he want to negotiate with anyone else? If he wants to play first grade, that's why? basically the, the carrot. <laughs> why not <laughs> he just paid why? that much money playing to the Wales Cup? Well, why not? Just no. just rather than put your body through that, unless you think that you've got still a point to prove in rugby league, you can make. For the next three years, you can make, or two years, whatever it may be, you can make another $1.7 million and tie up the end of your career. Like, I'm just saying, why wouldn't he think like that? Unless well, he if, has if the designed... Tigers end up spending, or if the Tigers pay X amount of his contract, then, you know, I think he takes that opportunity because he'll probably still get the money he's owed. Uh, just get to play first. Well, maybe he does. Words. Maybe he does. Maybe he just says, you know, you give me 300 and I'll get 400, well, 500 from somewhere else. But will he? That's the thing. Will he get? Will you know? Given that he has had a few injuries in the past couple of years, I'm not sure how many games he's actually played for the Tigers. I'm sure the numbers out there somewhere, but I'd suggest it's less than twenty. Um, given that he's he's had some injuries and and some form problems, who is going to pay him four to five hundred thousand dollars a year? Yeah. No. I, I mean, I don't yeah. know. Is someone know. is I... someone going to pay pay the four to five? Be- I'm surprised he hasn't already gone to England. And that may say something about the market for him, as far as I'm concerned. I, I would have thought if a club really wanted someone, I mean, look at the way that Blake Austin's playing over in the UK. I mean, he just needed that extra, that, that little pressure valve release, and he's carving up over there. Yeah, he's going to get the um, menace too. Yeah, and, you know, Jackson Hastings carving up over there. It, I'm surprised Reynolds hasn't had the the request yet if they actually wanted him and that's the, the biggest challenge for him I guess is that well the, the other big challenge mate is the money just isn't <clears throat> quite hmm. you know like he might get 400 um, maybe but I can't see him getting much more over 400 and, and are the Tigers going to be happy in paying 450 um, out to you know they're probably going to be happier paying 450 than 850 but if you free up, if you try and free up your your, your cap by paying someone else four fifty, it only leaves you four hundred in the cap yeah. to get another player. And and these days, if you're looking for a half or even a hooker slash half, you, you're not going to find a whole lot of real good ones for four hundred grand. No, it's a That's very good point. it's it's it's, a, it's a, not a nice it's not a nice situation for all round uh, for everyone around. But um, yeah, I'm I'm guessing that by the end of the year, you'll, there'll be some kind of a, at least. Uh, a short-term fix on what's happening, and that might be he, he goes somewhere else, or he just says, "I'm staying." So we'll see. Mm, we will. Well, that's been episode 198. Cox Sub it's one been... hour, by the way, about 41 <laughs> minutes. Yeah, but I'm still going to add the, uh, the the winning try and a couple yeah. of breaks here and there. Yeah, so we'll okay. end up being over 50. Okay. But that's all good. It's been good to chat to you, mate. Yes, We've you got too. Mate. Things pretty quickly. Uh, obviously, celebrating New South Wales uh, victory, back-to-back series wins. Um, just to let everybody realise, uh, Queensland have not won the State of Origin series since 2017. How delicious is that? I love it. There are kids. There are kids that are talking that have never seen Queensland win an Origin series. <laughs> Booyah! That's what we love. Yeah. Um, and there, yeah, there are kids that who are turned 15 who had never seen New South Wales win back to back either. Uh, but, <laughs> That's by the by. It's been a pleasure, mate. Uh, where can people follow you on the social media? Uh, just Instagram, mate. Uh, at Rob Cox with two Bs. R O W B C O X. That's where you'll find me. I'm very you dormant on, on Twitter, and I don't talk to anyone on Facebook. So yeah, I'm still waiting for the promotion of the show that you promised me. Uh, and um, we are also on Facebook, facebook.com/slash NRL Podcast. I'm at NRL Tweet or WD Nicholson. 
Mate, we are wrapped up. 45 minutes of Bliss. actual audio. Yes. Um, just a reminder, it's uh, 30 years uh, since the greatest grand final of all time. Uh, Tigers Raiders, they're playing this weekend, just in case you were thinking of doing anything this weekend. We do have to go and actually watch these games, man. We're getting to... Well, did you I mean, did you hear what they're doing on Fox this week? They've already done it, actually. Oh, no. A but... full a full game review sit-down chat with uh, Blocker, Ciro, uh, Elias, and a couple of Canberra players. They're doing a... It's, de- a, it's already been shown. A deconstruct. No, it's been filmed. Oh, okay. So it, it will be um, it will be shown this weekend. Lovely. Well, we are, I think we're doing different things over the next few weeks. You're off to... Where are you off to on your next trip, uh, mate? Next, You're going somewhere. Yeah, next trip is Alice Springs uh, to Birdsville via the Simpson Desert. And then um, from Birdsville through the Channel Country uh, for another DVD special. Can't wait. Lovely. I'm heading up to uh, Dippery Barrel Lodge again up there in Arnhem Land oh, uh, nice. next week for about a week. It's going to be tough. Wonderful. That's, just, that's what work calls, mate. Work I've still calls. got to get up there and do some filming for you and catch some barrel oh, for no. you as well. I'll catch some barrel. I'll catch the barrel. You just film it. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's been Rob Cox. I've been Warwick Nicholson. New South Wales. Back to back. We'll speak to you next time for our 199th podcast coxsmith we are getting so close to the 200 i know there is chats should be good the the whatsapp group wants to be in attendance when we record episode 200 so yeah when are you back from i'm um, back on the the sixth sixth of august okay i'm back on the first so we will try and whack in another episode there and then Mm. mid-august we'll try and make it happen so Yep. Yeah, it's going to be so disappointing um, because it's going to be just like every other one of these hundred and. No, we'll get together for it. We'll get together and do it. Some. Well, we still have. We have. We have. Have we had a invitation into someone's lounge room yet? No. No. <laughs> that no. was groundbreaking. That was. We did offer it, and nobody took it up. I mean, I, mean, yeah, I, I would have thought someone like the sheriff or BC or G or. I mean, Cuthill is in Perth mm. tonight. He could have given us his house. Absolutely. And we could have done the podcast. We could have done he something have else to be there. too. <laughs> done some damage. <laughs> uh, I just admire the Rembrandts on the wall. All right, that's been episode 199. Warwick Nicholson, Rob Cox. We'll see you next time. Cue the Pepsi. Catch you later, mate. Pep's there. Not the footy show. Show? Goes away out to Pierce. He gets one away to Tom Trebojevic. It's gone to Blake Ferguson. Ferguson, can he stand up? Now he throws the pass. He's got it back to you-know-who. Tedesco for the corner. Tedesco's over. It's a miracle. Oh, yeah. What about that one? Uh, no, it's Dello. Unbelievable. What about that from James Tedesco? Pepsi.